Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in this special topics lecture, I would like to discuss a very famous but very niche theorem in dynamical systems, which is called Lennard's theorem. Now, before I get into it, let's talk a little bit about some history. Okay, so in the early 1900s, when I was very much not alive, uh, from about 1920 to 1950, we had major advancements in technology, and one of those was the radio, and another one was the vacuum tube. Now, from the engineering and the mathematical perspective, there was a ton of research going into trying to understand the dynamics of these new technologies. And in particular, what people were interested in were nonlinear oscillations. So when I say nonlinear oscillations, I basically mean not sines and cosines. What is it that makes it nonlinear? Well, typically it's a nonlinear dynamical system that would generate it, but the linear aspect of this means, you know, we've seen from, from planar dynamical systems, from linear systems, solutions are always comprised of sines and cosines. So when I refer to a nonlinear oscillation, I just mean, you know, being much more complicated than just a linear superposition of sines and cosines. Now, what was interesting about this was that Again, just like many of the problems that we've seen early on in this, this uh, lecture series on dynamical systems, is that the radio and the vacuum tubes were being put to use to model typically electrical circuits uh, or similar nonlinear oscill uh, non oscillatory phenomena um, that typically fell into sort of the same form. Actually, I don't need an X here, pardon me. They could be modeled by a dynamical system that looks like this. Okay, so second order in time. So again, we, we've seen second order in time lots. Usually it comes from forces equal to mass times acceleration. But if it's coming from, um, from electrical circuits, typically this is like Kirchhoff's law, where these, these second derivatives come from. But nonetheless, second order in time differential equation, we see that we have some sort of nonlinear damping. And why is it that I call it damping? Because it's multiplied against the derivative. So again, a frictional force that we've, we might have seen before. We know that it's uh, typically something like an epsilon, a constant, times the derivative, right? It's slowing the velocity down. So this could be, you know, pumping energy in. It could be like a, a negative friction, right? It could be speeding us up. Or it could be slowing us down, depending on the functional form of F. And then G here is, you can think of this as sort of like the internal dynamics, the force that the actual uh, particle or the system or the electrical uh, current puts on itself, okay? Now, this is what's called a Lennard system, okay? So uh, let me spell this right. Lennard, that's a little accent there. Uh, system. It's also very possible that I am mispronouncing uh, this uh, person's name. Uh, I do ap apologize if you don't. If I am mispronouncing it and you know how to do it properly, please let me know in the comments. Um, so what's an example? Well, we've seen one. In my video on limit cycles, I introduced you to the Vanderpoel oscillator. All right? We looked at a case where... In the Vanderpoel oscillator, f of x is mu, some parameter value, and then times x squared minus 1, and g was just equal to x. So essentially what we were seeing in that system was that for small values of x, the system excites itself, so the damping is sort of negative, that's like the... the Negative friction, it's a weird way to think of it, but it helps me at least a little bit. It makes you want to slide, gets you excited. But if you become too large here, then you start being pulled back down to earth and you know you start getting more frictional force being pulled on you and you want to slow down. And we saw that the balance between these two things actually leads to an oscillation. Now, what's interesting about uh, the Lennard system or the Lennard equation here and in particular, the Vanderpoel oscillator is that for a variety of f and x's, or sorry, f of x and g of x functions, we can actually build electrical circuits that mimic this exact behavior that's going to be predicted by these dynamical systems. A very famous example 
from the Vanderpool Oscillator uh, is uh, a, a very famous book written by James Gleek on chaos. After he completed this book, somebody actually built a Vanderpool Oscillator and mailed it to him. They're very easy to build. Uh, and the, the beautiful part is, you know, you can kind of pick different forms for f of x and g of x, and you can build electrical circuits according to these things. Now, again, that's a little bit outside of my own area of expertise, so I can't help you build it, but if you could build it, please let me know. I would love to see it. Okay, so let's talk about Lennard's theorem. Now, Lennard's theorem is gonna give us some criteria for when we can guarantee that there's going to actually be a periodic solution here. So suppose, suppose F and G satisfy. Now we've got a long list of things that we need them to satisfy. Most of them are pretty easy. There's one near the end that becomes a little bit more complicated, but F and G are continuously differentiable. I'm gonna write in C1 of R, this might be a notation that you're not necessarily useful. C, C stands for continuous on the real number. C1 means it the function and its derivative, its first derivative, is continuous on the real numbers. So this just means these functions are smooth, okay? Well, what's the next one? G of minus x is equal to G of, uh, sorry, minus G of x, pardon me. You can, again, use the Vanderpool oscillator as the guiding principle here. You know, everything should adhere to basically uh, the functions that you're seeing with the Vanderpool oscillator. So that means that um, G has to be an odd function. F has to be an even function. Okay. And G of X has to be positive for all X positive. Okay, so these are sort of fairly easy to, to satisfy. You can come up with all kinds of functions that satisfy these. Here's the, the uh, most sort of tedious one, and this is the one that's sort of critical for the proof. We'll talk about it in a moment here. Uh, but the odd function, which I'm going to call f of capital X, which is going to be the antiderivative of little f of x. So how do I know that it's odd? Well, because little uh, f of x is even, you take the antiderivative in this exact way, you get an odd function, okay? Has exactly, exactly one positive root um, at, let's say, x equal to a. And it's negative for all x less than a and positive afterwards. Uh, maybe I'll keep writing up here just so that I don't lose you. And positive for all x bigger than a. And I know I have two ands here, but that's okay f of x goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. Okay, so this one's obviously a little bit more complicated, but what does Lennard tell us? Well, he says that then uh, this planar dynamical system that comes from just turning th this second order system in uh, this second order equation into a first order system. So let's write it minus g of x minus f of x times y has a unique, that's interesting, there's only one, stable, that's also interesting, limit cycle over the entire plane. It's uh, surrounding, sorry, surrounding the origin in the plane. And the way that we can show that it surrounds the origin is basically coming from these symmetry properties of F and G, okay? Um, 
So again, I want you to think about this for a second. Uh, you can very easily prove this for the Vanderpool Oscillator. Remember we did a lot of work showing that the Vanderpool Oscillator should have a limit cycle. We didn't actually prove it. We took M, or sorry, we took mu very, very large. You can easily check that all of these are true. In fact, the value of A for the Vanderpool Oscillator is the square root of three. And that proves that no matter what the value of mu is, you always have a unique stable limit cycle for this Vanderpool Oscillator. Okay, so uh, applying Lennard's theorem, very nice, sort of very easy here. But there's some interesting uh, pieces that I want to sort of note, all right? So how do we know sort of uh, some aspects of this? I'm not going to prove this is actually, you know, it's a little bit more technical. You have to use a lot of deep sort of phase plane methods to prove this thing. Um, but... I want you to take a look at something for a minute. Okay, so a couple remarks. So notice, based on these things, zero, zero, the origin is a fixed point. Well, that's okay. We probably didn't need someone to point that out to us. But then, so the Jacobian of this thing, remember, once we have a fixed point, one of the first things that we should do is take the Jacobian about it. This is going to be a zero, one g prime sorry minus g prime of zero and f of zero oh sorry minus f of zero which has eigenvalues so lambda one and two these things are going to be minus f of zero plus or minus uh f of zero squared and then uh minus 4g prime of 0 divided by 2. So where did I get that from? You can use the trace determinant formula or you can just find the eigenvalues of this thing yourself. You can use any sort of symbolic calculator. It's entirely up to you. Uh, but I want you to see this because there's a, a couple important aspects, some things that we can actually show right away. Okay. Well, g is odd. So this implies uh, sorry, there's two pieces, and I want you to see where these come from. G is odd, and uh, G of X is positive for all X positive. This implies that uh, G prime of 0 is greater than or equal to 0. Right, so it's an odd function, so it goes through 0, and as soon as it leaves 0, it's positive. Okay, so that means that initially it has to be moving up to the right in its, uh, if you graph this thing as x versus g of x. So we can immediately see that g prime of zero is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, that's interesting. So that means that we're subtracting something positive here. Okay, that's what I want you to see, or at least non-negative. Um, also, so again, that's using this condition. So conditions two and four. So uh, two plus four. Also, um, f of x is less than zero. I'm using capital F of x, right? The antiderivative for all x between zero and a. This tells us that f of zero, little f of zero, has to be less than zero, right? So that means, right? Because if you just go forward a little bit, this thing, you have to be integrating something negative uh, in order to get a negative number in here. So that means you, initially you have to start negative. Okay, so what does this tell you? You can actually put these two things together and this tells you that the real part of lambda one and two has to be positive, which implies zero, zero is unstable. Now, okay, that's interesting. Why is that interesting? Because one way that you could prove Lennard's system is using a trapping region, using the poincare Van dixon theorem, right? So the first thing you have to do is you have to rule out stability of one of the fixed points. So what I would like to do is I'd like to build a trapping region around the origin. Now, what's interesting here is Lennard's conditions, remember this is condition five, sorry. Lennard's conditions here tell me that 
I can build that trapping region around the origin. I can guarantee that if trajectories stay in that trapping region, they are not going to the origin because it's unstable, right? We have did this with uh, chemical oscillations and the rabbits and sheep model. You know, this is uh, pretty standard. This is something that we can do pretty well. Now, there's another thing that this condition five actually helps us when we use a trapping region here. So, in fact, uh, the existence of x equal to a in 5 acts to trap. So, acts to trap uh, trajectories. Uh, just like in the Vanderpool oscillator. So what I'm going to do is I'm not actually going to prove this for you. I just want to walk you through sort of how this works. I think it's a nice exercise. You could probably do this on your own. Um, but if you go back to the original limit cycle uh, video, we took mu to be very, very large, but we, we used a, basically a trapping theory or trapping region argument to show that we should be, you know, developing up a limit cycle here. Well, the existence of this point x equal to a, this sort of balance point for this antiderivative, actually helps to give you a trapping region. And the reason for that is that you're going to actually use a different representation of the phase plane here, the same one that we use for the Vanderpool oscillator. So in fact, what you would do is you would say y is equal to x dot plus capital F of x. Okay, so in this one that I have right here, I have uh, y is just equal to x dot. So it's going to be a different representation of the phase plane, similar to what we did with the Vanderpool oscillator. But again, it's all coming from the same equation. So it's equivalent, right? Proving that there's a, a limit cycle here is the same as proving there's a limit cycle here and vice versa. And what this actually gives you is that x dot is equal to y minus f of x just rearrange this equation and y dot is equal to minus g of x and when you look at the system in that way then you will be able to show uh, that there's a trapping region just by the existence of this x equal to a it tells you that x has to eventually start decreasing and so you can build a trapping region here in order to make your unique stable limit cycle. Okay, so I'm not actually going to prove it for you, but it uh, again, you can do it. You can do it using trapping regions. I've given you most of the steps. I want to see if you can try and work it out for yourself. But nonetheless, Lennard's theorem is a very important theorem, primarily for these engineering applications. If you're coming to this from an engineering background, you've probably taken a class uh, maybe an electrical engineering class or maybe an acoustics engineering class um, where you have seen this type of equation before and maybe you've seen some version of Lennard system or maybe you've just seen that unique stable limit cycle if you actually built one of these things in the lab. But nonetheless, nice way of proving the existence of a limit cycle in a very specific but very useful type of equation. When we come back in the next video, we'll start looking a little bit at perturbation theory. So I'll see you in the next video, everybody.